Welcome to Startup Health TV, I'm Logan Plaster. For many people, allergies are just an inconvenience. Sneezing, coughing, maybe you take some medicine when the pollen count is high. But for millions of others around the world, particularly children, severe allergies are a major health concern. Eat the wrong thing and you could go into anaphylactic shock. And it seems to be getting worse. According to one study by the NIH, over the last three decades, uh, peanut allergies have gotten five times worse in the UK. And we've seen similar increases elsewhere. Tackling this growing problem is my guest on today's show, Javier Evelyn, the CEO and founder of a startup called Allergy, which joined Startup Health in 2020. So Javier, he combined his experiences with a severe allergy with his training as a software developer to build both an app as well as a device for administering epinephrine that would make life a little bit easier, a little bit safer for folks with bad allergies. In our interview, we get into Javier's story, exactly what he's built, and how in 2020, his Detroit-based startup got a little help from Google. Stick around. All right, Javier Evelyn, CEO and founder of Allergy. Thanks for joining me today on Startup Health TV. Thanks so much, Logan. Uh, pleasure to be here, man. Great to connect with you. Um, let's just dive right in to, to what you've built. One of the cool things about Allergy in terms of the Startup Health portfolio is that you've got a, you've got a physical product, a device. It's not just a platform. It, it's a platform plus something you can hold in your hand. So let's just start with that. What have you built? Yeah, so it started off with my own, uh, I'll say problems that somebody coming up is one of the more than 220 million people that are affected by severe uh, multiple food allergies, right? Um, growing up, mom was in, uh, a nurse or becoming a nurse, lots of other healthcare professionals, but Logan, I was that hard-headed kid that wanted to be cool, never carry my EpiPen or anything like it. Uh, so as time went on, fast forward, I'm an adult, still a hard-headed uh, adult, my wife would say at this point. And we said, I said to myself, there's got to be a better way to kind of let this fit in the background, right? It's mandatory, actually, or strongly recommended from doctors to always carry your life-saving medication, which is the EpiPen at all times. So mm. I thought, hey, look, we can combine the best of two worlds or all worlds by combining the most ubiquitous device that we all carry with us, our cell phones, with a redesigned EpiPen. Kind of like this, looks like a battery case for your phone's life, except you want to save your own life. And essentially, once you kind of take it off on this case... Um, within a couple of seconds after removing it from that phone case, we're going to notify the right people. You're going to inject your leg, not my arm, like we just did just yet. And we toss this out. And essentially just that protocol uh, that we're kind of tapping into basically is going to be us uh, uh, notifying the right individuals. So your mom, dad, spouse, whomever needs to be notified about where you're at, what you're allergic to and how to save your life has that information. So we're basically copy and pasting a physician recommended protocol on the hardware side. And we all have some cool software that I'm sure we're going to talk about throughout our conversation as well, too. So um, started with scratching my own itch, and then we found that there was a bigger market. How many folks uh, should be carrying an EpiPen close to them uh, and aren't? Maybe it's in their glove, glove box or their backpack. I mean, really, you said 200 million people or somewhere around there have a severe allergy. Yeah. How many folks do you think aren't really having this life-saving uh, medication close at hand? Yeah, so the last conversation or study you came across was within the United States, there's 30 plus million folks, 220 million worldwide, and around two thirds of patients and caregivers don't always carry the life-saving medication because it's clunky, uh, inconvenient to carry, and then quite frankly, you know, like I said earlier, there's the, that social stigma of making you stand out and feel different, and mm -hmm. I think the world we live in now is even highlighted even more, right, uh, with all the social pressures, the social media bullying that goes on a lot uh, within the food allergy space as well, too, so Really, our goal is to be, uh, especially now that I'm in that parent-ish age, you know, I don't want another me 2.0, right, that's going to be living a life. Uh, so our goal is to make sure we build tools that are there when you need it and not when you don't, right? So uh, Javier Jr. or Logan Jr., whomever that meet, uh, can be out at brunch with their friends in the next couple of months when it's nice outside and go from brunch selfie to, oh, my God, I put something in my, they put something in my dish. And within a couple of seconds, um, the trigger, the protocol has been triggered and we give a little bit more peace of mind to the right individuals, loved ones, et cetera. Okay. So you've got the hard hardware piece, which really helps it to be uh, available because we've all got our phones within you know, arm's reach. Uh, but then there's the software side. And so I'm guessing something happens when you uh, release the device and when you actually take the shot. So talk to me about the software side. 
Yeah, for sure. So, you know, my background comes from, from Chicago originally, but our company was born in Detroit. Um, I made the reverse migration that most folks, everybody uh, in the past was leaving Detroit, but it's getting better these days. Um, it was really to kind of get started off as a software engineer. And I was really fortunate, Logan, to kind of get a crash course on what I call the triangle offensive healthcare. Remember, I'm a Chicago person, so that's an ode to Phil Jackson. Um, but talking about your patients, payers, and providers. Uh, so uh, from uh, my time working on multiple uh, mobile applications from medication reconciliation apps, all the way to HIPAA compliant HEDIS apps, et cetera, I said that there may be a way to kind of streamline a very specific niche uh, uh, problem or solve it through this type of solution. Uh, so in addition to providing the alerts once our devices in market, we currently have the lifestyle app, which is basically the precursor to that alert mechanism application that uh, Logan or myself, anybody that has a food allergy or their kids can create a profile, again, that's HIPAA compliant so that it's shareable with the right individuals. So we're talking about recipes at this moment. We're talking about uh, grocery store gotcha. items as well to ensure that whether it's uh, someone getting dropped off or babysitting down the road, again, different world we're in, to make sure there's a lot more peace of mind. And of course, when it comes to the holidays, a lot more communication, because I think a lot of times in our space, Logan, if you have a food allergy, this, this is life, right? We know that hey, I got snacks on me at all times, et cetera, et cetera. How do we continue to uh, educate as needed, even if it's on demand, those that are taking care of our kids and ourselves and, and the like. So again, the ability to navigate different recipes, et cetera. And we have some cool features down the road that are centered around restaurants as well. Got it, got it. So while you have this hardware, it makes the EpiPen uh, functionally, you know, easy to grab. It's really a whole patient journey. It's got the recipes, it's got the uh, care protocols, et cetera, from, from start to finish. Absolutely. Uh, tell me a little bit more about what you mentioned starting your company in Detroit. What's the, what's the environment there for health innovation? What's your experience been like in Detroit? Man, Detroit's been amazing. You know, when you talk about support, I think you're based on the East Coast over in, uh, in somewhere in, in a small city, Russ. Baltimore. Yeah, Baltimore, man. So it's like you essentially get a chance to, there's so much, I would say, number one, it's an underdog mentality in the city. And I've always low-key had that. So yeah. um, I don't know if that's right or wrong, but it's what fuels some folks here. But beyond that, when you think about Zoom, rewinding about 100 plus years, that was the Silicon Valley. This was the Silicon Valley of the world, right? all innovation from the auto space. And although it was auto heavy back in the day, you still have your big three. Life Sciences is actually having a moment right now in Michigan in general, and it's starting to trickle into the city of Detroit. So when you think about uh, programs such as Scale Health, which is an uh, uh, extension of MedHealth, uh, the MedHealth Summit was a uh, cross-border initiative between Detroit as well as South, uh, uh, just Ontario, if I'm not mistaken, right? To ensure that we can kind of learn lessons from across the border and best practices, et cetera. Um, but beyond that, obviously, we're now on the East or West Coast. So I truly believe that um, the only silver lining um, when you think about uh, 2020 and the pandemic is the fact that you have a lot more flyover, quote unquote, state capital. They're kind of dropping a couple packages as they fly over our states now, uh, which is not like a nice to have, but it's, it should have been that way in the first place. So I think as the funding catches up with the technical talent and grit that we typically have in the Midwest, I'm from Chicago, so it's copy and paste. I think we'll have a special moment. In fact, um, there's some big programs going on right now. Um, follow me on social at Javier, but uh, you'll see that it's it's having a moment. But I think from a healthcare perspective, it's starting to sprout up as we kind of are you know, learning from other industries that have done it extremely well from a startup perspective all the way up into corporate America. I love it. Yeah, I think that that, I mean, coming from Baltimore, I think that that, that underdog mentality really is a, a real thing in entrepreneurship. Uh, it gives people that some grit it creates community around what, what you're building, a uh, certain pride, which is really helpful for the commitment you need. Uh, let's, let, let's talk a little bit about kind of where you're at, where Allergy's at in its uh, entrepreneurial journey. I know that you were supported by Google for startups. Tell us a little bit about that as a milestone, what that meant, what you learned. Yeah, for sure. So it came in a perfect time. Uh, obviously, it was the, the middle of the pandemic, um, things that happened to our brother, George Floyd, who was lynched. Uh, so to see Google and other companies kind of step up to the plate and not just kind of put out hashtags, startup health is in the same bucket, making sure that we were supported as well too. Around that same period, it was a great opportunity for us. For us, we were at a stage where we were in an inflection point. Beginning of last year was all about, hey, we're gonna do a series uh, seed and kind of make it moving. But the market said something different because of the panic. 
And also we had some uh, reflection opportunities as well too, to kind of fine tune it, speed the market. So the GF, uh, GFS Google Startups uh, program was amazing. We got some grant uh, awards and beyond the, the financial piece, it was really about the support. Um, as you know, you're basically a founder man. So as you talk to other folks that are in the same bucket as yourself, um, it's such an incredible value add to have support, whether it's Google ad support, which they show so much love on. Shout out to Google again for that, Google startups. And then obviously all the way towards connecting us with a cohort of individuals through Goody Nation as an example out of Atlanta um, that's doing some amazing things. So talking to other up and coming uh, healthcare, digital health entrepreneurs to kind of trade notes. Uh, so collab collectively, it was an incredible experience tailored to the individual. Um, with support from other folks from the Google ecosystem as well, too. So really timely for us. In fact, it also um, came at a time where we were thinking about some new software uh, from a B2B perspective, we'll talk about in a second, centered around oral immunotherapy. And that gave us uh, the momentum to get into another pitch competition later on in Detroit, Detroit Demo Day, where we came in third place, um, uh, supported by Quicken Loans, um, uh, the big company out of Detroit. And incredible experience. Uh, I think they have another one maybe coming soon. So if anybody that's out there that sees it apply, quality programming, quality individuals, and it just gives you an extension of your team with folks that really want to see you win. And um, I wouldn't, I would definitely uh, do it again if we were given that opportunity. Who wouldn't? Is Google, but for the for the right reasons. Okay. And where do you, where would you say the product is in terms of its maturity? Um, what are you in the market with, and what are you developing uh, right now? Absolutely. So we do have our lifestyle app available on iOS and Android. We saw an uptick in downloads as well as ratings at around the George or actually Juneteenth of last year. We did a nice session with Thermo Fisher Scientific and other folks, FBI as well. Um, from a FDA perspective, um, after some drawbacks last year, we're looking to submit in the next within the next 12 months at this point. We have a very, very clear pathway to market. We're not just the device, even though we're talking about the technology piece, it's really a drug delivery device, right? So because we leave you with drug, it's approved as such. Uh, but being that we're not the first EpiPen or epinephrine auto injector company, it's clear. So we found the right partners. That was the, one of the main things we had to make sure we got from a regulatory perspective. And with that, I feel like with all our cop powers combined, I'm an 80s baby, uh, you know, that's so that's that type of mentality um, has allowed us to kind of move the needle forward. So the next stages or steps towards commercializing our device, including uh, the regulatory piece, would be solidifying our commercial partnerships. Uh, we're all about the David with Goliath as opposed to David versus Goliath because we do want to take advantage of the networks that are out there. And we think we could do it at scale, but it would be easier and faster to do it. Uh, we're having some really, really interesting conversations, even at the stage that we're at now. Um, one last piece, I, I mentioned that we have a separate software again that's available on iOS and Android. Um, the biggest, uh, I would say, sub area of food allergies coming out of the oral immunotherapy space. Okay. Um, all that is your kid or anyone else that you know has a food allergy. You want to kind of micro, I'm going to keep it simple, but micro dosing, let's say three milligrams, one for two weeks, six milligrams of peanut flour or peanuts, et cetera. So hopefully improve the threshold so that if you ever have cross contamination, it's not as severe potentially, right? Um, there's no cure for peanut or for any type of food allergy, right? So this is the closest thing you have towards any type of success. At uh, the beginning of last year, the very first FDA approved version of this came out, was approved by, uh, I believe, A Immune. They were acquired seven months later for a couple billion dollars by Nestle Health Science. So what that taught us, Logan, is that being that it got approved with an FDA asterisk mark, meaning that you still have to carry an EpiPen per their recommendations, you still need to manage this a certain way, and the communication needs to be there as well too. We saw a blind spot and an opportunity and got some IP around it and had some really interesting conversations with the leader in the space. So you mentioned earlier this about not just being a, a reactive type of company, hey, something's going on, rent to my device. This is where the proactive patient-driven design approach kind of kicks in, where we kind of make sure we tap into the audience, your patients, your parents, obviously the pharma companies to make sure that we're in line. So in aggregate, we are commercially ready on our lifestyle app. Please download it free. For anyone watching this call, obviously, or this uh, or this webinar, this call today, chat, um, and obviously, we would love to have more additional conversations with other advocacy groups. We've talked with pretty much all of them, but obviously, we'll share information, and we'd love to get more folks involved with the upcoming um, OIT uh, platform we have in the pipeline. 
I can make sure that all that download information is in the description. Uh, this is sort of pulling back a little bit from the uh, micro to the macro, but where do you feel like we're at culturally in terms of our uh, perspective on severe allergies? I feel like I feel like over the last you know couple of generations there have been cultural shifts about how we see. Um, like you just mentioned microdosing, you know, should we exposure, should we expose children to, to these things so that the allergies are less severe? Um, are there dietary problems that we're causing some of these things? So kind of where do you feel like we're at now? And I don't know, and where does the technology sort of fit in and help us in that moment? I think that the food allergy, um, and obviously I'm biased, but being as close as I am to the market, I believe it's having a moment. Um, a couple of years ago, I got a chance to pitch in front of the Food Allergy Science Initiative back by Harvard and MIT. So it was, we had this tech company with a bunch of biotech companies doing amazing science, uh, R&D type projects. And, you know, part of the discussion, um, someone from the NIH came out to kind of discuss the trends of uh, public dollars going in other areas, right? Food allergy is pretty low. And when you kind of like map against, you know, uh, if you kind of use that as a crystal ball saying that oh, all, my, all of a sudden that arrow or the hockey stick starting to go up in terms of additional funding, that kind of was an indication that the private dollars will follow. And that's actually been expressed by the OIT companies and other food allergy adjacent companies. Uh, furthermore, um, there's been a sharp increase uh, as it relates to food allergy insurance claims at about 377% over the course of like an 11 year period. So with that being said, it's one of those things that it needs to be addressed more. Um, I'll also say that the support groups and social media and other platforms, advocacy groups, um, I sit on the board of the uh, diversity side of the board over at FACT, F-A-A-C-T, one of the faster uh, growing food allergy orgs that connects us with the patients, doctors, et cetera. And you hear so many stories. Um, although as an example, just this week, uh, the, there are eight top allergies the ninth one, this is a scene from the outside, it may not seem significant, but if your kid has a sesame allergy, which was just approved by the White House to be officially declared as a ninth allergen, that's a huge milestone. So when you think about public to private dollars and the legislation starting to kick up a little bit, the online conversations, FAIR is the top organization that's doing work in this space and other folks, I think we're having a good moment. And lastly, I'll say that even though I've said food allergy, food allergy, food allergy, Really, it's all about what the food allergy triggers, and that's anaphylactic shock, right? So the University of Michigan and some other folks are starting to run some trials. This is real early stuff. We're not involved with it, but kind of figuring out the small uh, amounts of cases that vaccine-related um, anaphylaxis has come up. Um, is there something there? And how do we as a company, we're watching it very closely, how do we kind of help out those individuals as well? Very nice. Well, we're getting towards the end of our time, but the final question I want to ask you uh, has more to do with entrepreneurship. A lot of the folks who watch these videos are themselves uh, entrepreneurs, uh, healthcare entrepreneurs. Uh, you, you know, manage your team there in Detroit. It comes with all of its own uh, very interesting struggles. Uh, I know you moved offices, I think. So I wonder if you could just give a, just a piece of advice to fellow entrepreneurs about kind of how you stay uh, focused and passionate. How do you keep sort of the big moonshot, you know, final uh, goal in mind when you're battered by sort of these day-to-day -day challenges of, of working in uh, the startup community? Yeah, I think you nailed it, man. When you think about it, healthcare is not for the weak of heart. Um, I think it's said often that if you come in here only for the monetary uh, possibilities, a fifth of the GDP roughly spent in this space, you can do it, but it's going to be a long road, right? When you get that gut punch, things that go your way, legislation doesn't go your way, it's more than just that. Um, I believe that taking the L as a lesson and not a loss is the very first piece of that. Before you even get there, right, if you're new to this space, um, especially I think this happens a lot with our tech, bro uh, tech brothers and sisters that are coming into the space. Um, yes, you can move fast and break things, but if you do that, it may not get fixed in healthcare, depending upon uh, the route you're going. Uh, so come in with humbleness and come in with the understanding that you don't have all the answers, even though your technology may be fascinating. Uh, getting the clinical folks, getting stakeholders involved. One of the first books I read was a Stanford Biodesign book to really get a baseline information or uh, understanding of how this thing actually works. So I believe those combinations. And lastly, um, my personal, I'll say, uh, 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 motto, as well as one of our core values, you adapt and attack, right? Uh, so at the beginning of last year, we had one strategy, but as time went on, 
COVID took over and, that's, and rightfully so, right? So from an FDA perspective, everything shifted. What do you do as a company? Uh, so adapting and attacking kept this strong and relevant. And um, other than that, make sure you just get out there. Um, but those are some of my key things. The main one is taking that uh, lesson as a, as a, the L as a lesson, not a loss. There's nothing you can't do. It's the evergreen mentality. I love it. I love it. Adapt and attack. It's a, I, I, I'm guessing you played sports growing up. Seems like a sports metaphor. Adapt and attack. All right. Uh, Javier, great to talk to you. Great to hear what's going on with allergy. I'm definitely going to be watching in 2021 uh, as you all um, continue to, to roll out awesome products and your platform and looking at that FDA uh, process. So thanks for taking the time today. Thanks so much, Logan. And shout out to Startup Health for the opportunity as well. All right. Be well. Cheers. Quick word about this show, in case you're new around here. At Startup Health, we believe in broadcasting the stories of health moonshot progress, the stories of the most forward-thinking entrepreneurs in health. If you want more of this good news about healthcare's problem solvers, make sure that you subscribe to our channel, hit that notification button, and follow us on social media at Startup Health.